Today, guys, we have a video up that is uh, a little bit different. Um, this one is actually the first one I have uh, my little crib notes on over here. Usually, I just kind of, you know, eyeball it and hope for the best. But today, we have a little bit of a, a mini script almost. Uh, it's going to be end up being a two-part video, um, but basically. This is kind of for your beginner, for your parent who is going out shopping, who is trying to learn a little something about the product before we go ahead and uh, recommend things to kids and all that good stuff. But it is basically just kind of a primer on kind of like a glossary of terms about uh, how to go about shopping for a pair of boots for your kid. Um, or for yourself, for that matter. Um, there is a lot of stuff on here that is really basic stuff, and there's some more stuff on here that is a little bit more complicated, but in the end, I think uh, everybody will be able to learn at least a little something, at least I would hope, and uh, so let's get started. Uh, it's going to end up, like I said, being a two-part video, so our first installation is going to be the upper, essentially, so we're going to start off with uh, just kind of the anatomy of, uh, of the upper of a cleat. Real simple stuff, and I'm just choosing any old boot. I'm not choosing uh, anything based on really any particular specification or anything like that. Just showing off what I got in my hand. So, the various different parts of a boot. For really anybody to uh, know anything about a boot, you have to know exactly what it is that you're looking at, obviously. Um, I know that sounds a little bit silly, but uh, there are parts of, uh, of a shoe that aren't necessarily as self-explanatory as others, so I'll go ahead right on through the uh, uh, th through the different portions of the shoe and kind of give you an idea of what's what. So first, obviously, is the upper, which is, for all intents and purposes, the part of the shoe that obviously is not the outsole, which is the part on the bottom. So the top, obviously, upper, bottom equals outsole. Each of those two sections is broken up into various different areas too. You have the forefoot or the vamp. You have the midfoot right through the middle of the shoe. Usually goes from the toes back almost to the heel. And then obviously you have the heel right back here. Another part of the upper that uh, gets an awful lot less talk than, uh, than other portions of it obviously are the interior of the shoe which includes the sock liner, this little thing right here. And obviously this uh, the opening where your ankle actually is right here and then inside the shoe where your foot goes again all pretty self-explanatory but gotta get through it um, bottom of the shoe like we talked about right up here is the forefoot midfoot through here and again the heel which you'll often find taller studs on the heel but we'll get into that in just a little bit so the first zone we're going to be talking about here today is going to be the upper like I said so the upper, as you now know, is broken up into essentially three sections, really four. The four sections being forefoot, midfoot, heel, and the interior of the shoe. So some variables with an upper are, first of all, the material the upper is made out of. For instance, over here we have a proprietary trade named leather known as Taurus on the upper of this particular shoe. This is the Audi Power Predator. This over here is a kangaroo leather shoe. Up the upper on this one is a material known as Kanga Light, which we'll get into in a minute. This one here is what's known as synthetic, which really includes any material that essentially is not leather on an upper. For instance, Kanga Light is very close to a leather, however it is a synthetic simply because it's not real natural material. So, once again, you call it a synthetic. Over here we have another kangaroo leather boot. This is the Audi Pure 4 SL. And then on the end here, this is a shoe that many of you probably will not recognize, and that may very well be for the best, but don't get the wrong idea about it. This is the Adidas Telstar 2 in the soft ground version. Just wanted to show off a soft ground and simultaneously show off a shoe that is made out of full grain leather as well, which again, we'll get into in just a minute. So the various different materials... Um, really have different purposes, different strengths, different weaknesses. The purpose of a material such as Taurus over here, Taurus was invented by Adidas actually, and the stated purpose of Taurus, which again is just a trade name for a treated leather, Taurus is meant to be as durable as calfskin, which is oftentimes, uh, calfskin is basically another word for this stuff down here, full grain leather. Full grain leather is calfskin. Calfskin tends to be a little bit more durable, takes on a little bit more water, 
and it also it is a little bit stiffer than kangaroo leather. Now, calfskin, it, this is not calfskin, I'll tell you that right now. The only thing about this is it's meant to have the same qualities, the same durability as calfskin, while not taking on as much water, which it doesn't because it's a very thin material, and it's also just as supple as a kangaroo leather, which means it stretches very well and it's not as hard as a calfskin. That was the, pur the stated purpose behind Taurus. That's why Adidas invented it, essentially to take on some of the qualities of a better upper material, while at the same time having, um, you know, obviously the characteristics and feel of a kangaroo leather. And kangaroo leather is exactly what we're looking at right here. As you can see, the difference actually is pretty noticeable, even when you're just pressing on it with your finger. Looks a little stiff, feels a little bit rigid. Kangaroo has no such problem, that is for certain. And that is with the exact same amount of force being exerted on the toe there. You can see that one just has a little bit more squish to it. Um, it's just, it's a softer material, kangaroo leather is. It does take on water, um, quite, a, quite a bit actually. Um, it does make the boots particularly heavy when you're either sweating a lot or uh, playing in the rain. And uh, it does definitely make a difference in the performance of the shoe as well. Kangaroo leather is very soft and very supple. It stretches to a wide foot. It stretches to a narrow foot if it's not wide enough already. Oftentimes, kangaroo leather shoes are made very, very snug, obviously with the intention of stretching to the shape and size of a foot. Which also is another thing that Kanga Light, which is a proprietary um, creation by Nike, Kanga Light does a very similar thing. It stretches and it shapes and it fits and it feels not at all unlike kangaroo leather. However, it's treated so that seams are sealed, and it is also, uh, basically it's a material that doesn't take on water quite as much as a kangaroo leather. And again, that's very much layman's terms. It is a synthetic material, um, technically, because it's been treated so, so much, um, as a result that it's not entirely natural, so that you have to call it a synthetic material, which makes sense, obviously. But again, doesn't take on nearly as much water, and it still has all those same characteristics. It, it does tend to be just a little bit less durable than kangaroo leather, though, so that's obviously something to pay attention to as well. Next up, you have full-on microfiber synthetic. Microfiber is basically just another word for, again, really, I hate to say it, but it's, it's kind of a soft plastic. Um, the microfiber upper generally has a little bit of a muted touch, which means that when you're putting your foot on the ball, it doesn't nearly, you don't feel as much of the ball as you would with a natural material. Um, it's not altogether uh, soft or supple the way a leather is. It tends to be a little bit stiff, but it molds to your foot very well. They do not stretch. Uh, that's important to note. They don't actually stretch. They do mold, so they shape a little bit to the shape of your foot, but they will not expand their size all that much. One exception is simply around the opening, because right here on the heel, there are two separate areas where the material is stitched, so those stitches are meant to give way just ever so slightly so that your foot has a little bit more comfort around the opening there. Again, and here we have another kangaroo leather shoe. You see, again, it's very soft, very supple. And then we move on to the full grain, or the calfskin leather. Calfskin, you can see, considerably stiffer. It is definitely a tougher material. It does take on water, but not as much as a kangaroo leather. However, and it is, I should also mention, extremely durable. It can definitely take some punishment. Um, however, the thing about it is, again, it's not very soft. It does not shape to your foot quite as well as a kangaroo leather. So that's def definitely something to be on the lookout for when you decide to go shopping for your next pair. So, our next part of the upper is the midfoot. Midfoot obviously being right through here. Most midfeet are extremely narrow. And the reason for that is simply because the human foot doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of width right through the middle of the shoe. Or I should say right through the middle of the foot. There aren't a whole lot of features to talk about when it comes to a midfoot. Uh, basically, if you're looking for more information about, you know, the width, shape, and size of a midfoot, something like that, then you should definitely check out our Wide Cleats for Wide Feet video. That will give you some, uh, some details on that. Um, obviously, another portion of the upper is most definitely the opening on the shoe. Again, not a whole lot to talk about there. Really, the only feature associated with the opening will be materials at the heel here. And, of course, which are different, very different from one shoe to the next. And, of course, the other thing being certain shoes have a little piece on them called a unitong, or some people like to call it a nib. 
But for instance, the Audi Zero, as you can see here, has a flexible unitong. It's not nearly as soft as a Copa Mundial, which is one of uh, Adidas's classic shoes. has a very soft unitong, does not aggravate the skin on the back of the foot. A unitong that's stiff like this one can definitely do that. In Audi Pure SL, the unitong is barely there. Truthfully, a lot of people cut that unitong right off, so that's not really one to pay attention to. Some of the materials you'll find at the opening, um, you have the vast majority made these days have a suede material right at the opening. This one right here is a microfiber suede that is essentially, it's very soft and it's very, you know, pliable. However, it does take on sweat. When you start to uh, sweat through your socks, you're going to find that it catches right on back here. This is another microfiber suede that happens to be a good deal uh, softer than it is on the Audi Power. And the reason for that, simply because, obviously for comfort level, but also a softer suede tends to stick to your sock just ever so slightly more. And as a result, that sticky um, feel, that kind of tacky feel to it, keeps your shoe in place and doesn't allow it to move around when you don't want it to. For instance, in uh, bad weather. A uh, very similar uh, heel on the Maestri 2s. Actually, these have been updated from the original one. The original Maestri didn't have this material back here. It was actually an all-around synthetic on the heel. Another um, aspect, obviously, is the sock liner. There are a couple different features to sock liners that you should definitely uh, keep an eye out for. The majority of modern sock liners have at least some, for some form of uh, like a porous foam in them. As you can see here on the Audi Power Predator, it has a porous foam right on the forefoot, through the little toe there, and then on the heel. That porous foam is essentially designed so that it does not take on a whole lot of moisture. Um, and at the same time provides as much comfort as possible. The Audi Power actually does something of a bad job of doing that. One of your better alternatives is most definitely on the Tiempo Legend 4. You'll find that the sock liner has a porous foam insert uh, on it that is another uh, proprietary trade name for a material called Poron. Poron is essentially just a very, very soft kind of uh, foam material, offers spring to the bottom of your step. Um, Really, it doesn't do a whole heck of a lot more than that. It's essentially just extra cushion. Uh, it does provide, most definitely, a comfortable footbed. Uh, more comfortable, I would say, than the Audi Power, only because the footbed on the Audi Power tends to be very, very thin. And when you have foam in places that aren't supported by another strong synthetic material, you find that that foam tends to sag, and then you're standing right on the bottom of your shoe. Some sock liners, uh, for instance, the Audi Zero comes with two sock liners. It has what's referred to as the ultralight sock liner and the comfort sock liner. The ultralight sock liner is one that, quite frankly, there isn't a whole heck of a lot to. It is porous, but again, you'll see no foamy material or anything like that. It is a little bit of, uh, there is a little bit of foam on the bottom of this uh, sock liner. However, it's very, very thin and provides very little protection, very little comfort, and very little stability. Um, basically, the idea behind the Audi Zero in general is less is more, so you don't find a whole lot of concerns in that regard. Um, but the Comfort Sock Liner that also accompanies the F50 Audi Zero is a different story. Uh, it's a thicker material, has a little bit more spring to it, a little bit more cushion, a little bit more comfort. Um, it's like, a, it's black, almost, it feels almost like a velvety material. It's very comfortable. And uh, basically what we recommend to people when it comes to the Audi Zeros is if you're going to be wearing the Audi Zero, you should definitely, when you're breaking the shoe in, break it in with the Comfort Sock Liner so that you get a feel for how the shoe is supposed to feel. And also the shoe molds a little bit better to your foot when you're using the Comfort Sock Liner because that is the intended shape of the shoe. Um, another sock liner with not a whole heck of a lot to it is the Audi Pure SL. Again, the idea is weight reduction, kind of a minimalist thing. Um, and then you have what you'll find in 90% of soccer cleats out there in the world today is what's called a die-cut EVA sock liner. EVA is actually a material that the majority of sock liners are made out of. It's essentially, it's, uh, it feels almost cardboardy. It's got a little bit of a squish to it, so it's a little bit more soft. It's got a little bit more fabric to it, but it's a very cardboard-like stiff feel. And uh, when they say die cut, what that essentially means is it is not cut pre-molded the way many sock liners are. As you can see on a sock liner such as this one, you'll see it rises up around that contour of the heel and is meant to just kind of hug the curves of your foot. A die cut EVA sock liner does no such thing. A die cut sock liner is essentially just this fits in the bottom of the shoe, that's what we're going with. 
The vast majority of die cut sock liners, which come in pretty much if you're buying a shoe for under $100, this is the sock liner you're getting. Um, now this sock liner has some pluses and some minuses. Obviously plus being it's extremely inexpensive. It's really not that big a deal to, uh, to find a shoe um, with this at a good price. Uh, disadvantages being it is very stiff, it's quite uncomfortable, very little shock absorption, and does not provide the kind of stability you need through the bottom of your foot. Especially when you're meant to be, you know, running at full pace, and uh, there's no spring back to your foot. Because the idea behind a cleat is, a cleat is meant to release out of turf quickly, so that it actually springs up and hits the bottom of your foot as you're springing forward on your forefoot. The idea behind that being it offers you the most support and helps you accelerate as well. A die cut EVA sock liner does not do any of those things. And again, when it gets wet, it does get heavy. Uh, most sock liners don't have that issue, especially synthetic sock liners, more tacky sock liners. You're not going to find that as a problem. All right. So for the rest of the upper, that pretty much leaves us with some uh, different features and technology and, of course, the external heel counter. Now, the majority of top-end shoes, I shouldn't say the majority, but a good number of top-end shoes have this apparatus that's built onto the outside of the upper, known as an external heel counter. The idea behind an external heel counter is it's supposed to provide extra spring in your step for when you're running on your forefoot. The idea is, again, just extra sock, shock absorption. Sorry. When you are running at full speed, if you're running, your toe, obviously, or you should say your foot, is bending forward like this. Now, the idea behind an external heel counter is when you're first making contact with the ground, the heel counter is meant to spring up and meet your foot. Now, a heel counter on the outside of your shoe has the added bonus of protecting your foot as well. An external heel counter has a, does a great job of keeping excess pressure, say, for instance, from somebody else's studs off of your heel. This is a good example of an inbuilt heel counter right here. Now, the inbuilt heel counter does also assist, most definitely, in release and the meeting of the bottom of your foot in most cases. Uh, in particular, the Legend 4 does an excellent job of rebounding quickly. Um, but it does not, however, offer the same protection as an external heel counter. You can see here, there's a good deal of flexion right through the back of the shoe. And also, you'll notice that it's uh, when you press on it, again, you've just got that extra little bit of, uh, of mobility that will provide for you know, extern you know, outside pressure being able to hit your foot. When you're pressing on an external heel counter, you're not getting that same sort of flexion. It's very stiff. And the idea being, again, you don't want to get cleated because it hurts and it can do a lot of damage. Another inbuilt heel counter right here. Another idea behind an inbuilt heel counter is that essentially when it's part of the shoe, durability concerns don't arise. External heel counters, while there are very few instances of defective heel counters, when there are instances of defective heel counters, they are not only dangerous because they can actually cut you, but they are also, well, they, they ruin a shoe like nothing else. I mean, you can rip an upper and tape it up, but you cannot tape together an external heel counter. Another example of the external heel counter. One slight disadvantage of an external heel counter is that it has a preformed shape. It does not stretch in any way, shape, or form. So if your heel is wider than the heel counter, you're going to feel that pressure and it's going to hurt you a good deal. And same deal, external heel counter. So some of the technologies associated with uppers. Uh, the Predators are well known for the technology on their upper, which is the Predator applique. The Predator applique is simply a silicon slash rubber material that is placed on the upper, on the instep of the shoe. And the idea being when you strike a ball with your instep, it provides a little bit more power, a little bit more bounce off of the, uh, off the upper and it gives a little bit more control over the ball when you have it in the air. So when you're kicking a ball, you really get a feel for the ball with that Predator applique. Another upper technology is on the CTR360. It has these touch pods. Now the idea behind touch pods are they actually dampen the effect of striking a ball on these two spots. And the idea behind that, obviously, is to keep a ball close to your body. When you're receiving a pass at high speed or something like that, you can put the outside of your foot on the ball and kind of stop that ball, slow it down, and keep it close to your body so you can maintain possession. Also on the Maestri 2 is what's known as the pass pad. It has little rubber fins uh, right through the mid midfoot of the shoe, as you can see there. And those fins are essentially another um, idea of just being able to stop a ball short. 
because the idea behind a mainstream two is to be able to receive and distribute a ball very capably, and the technology obviously helps it to that end. One of the bonuses of both these two shoes on the upper, some of the technology associated with them, is that they are extremely, extremely light. One piece of the upper on the F50 that is very important to its design is what's known as the sprint web. You'll see little TPU bands all through the inside of that shoe, and that TP, those TPU bands are essentially there to help the shoe maintain its shape on the upper. And again, with this particular material, this K-leather, this upper right here, the technology associated with this is, again, for weight reduction, for allowing you to run your fastest for the absolute longest. And that about, um, I'm pretty sure that wraps up our uh, kind of exploration of the upper of a soccer cleat. Obviously, there is uh, way more to it. There's a lot more technology out there. Um, and obviously, technology always breeds questions. So if you guys have any, please don't hesitate to let me know. And also, uh, we're going to be putting this up on our Gold Store family channel, which will be the very first video in that channel. So anyone tuning into Gold Store family to check this out, feel free and head over to Gold Store USA for more in-depth details of each one of these shoes. And if you happen to be visiting over from Gold Store USA, thank you very much, guys, for checking us out, and uh, we hope you like the video. Thanks again, and uh, if you guys, like I said, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments, and we'll get to them as soon as we can.